Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ethics and Regulations for Human Subjects Research Lecture. Um, today, I'm going to be focusing on the history of human subjects regulation. My name is Katie Porter. I'm a research scientist at the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics and Palliative Care. And I'm also the director of the Research Ethics Consultation Service um, that's supported by UW Seattle Children's and also serves um, other institutions within our region. So today I'm going to be talking about um, research ethics and the history of research ethics and regulations. And we're going to start by considering some historical and recent ethical failures in clinical research, and then also introduce some sources of ethical guidance. So the first question I think that's important to ask is, what is research? And this will kind of help define the scope of what we're talking about today. So. I'm going to pull from some United States regulations and define research as a systematic investigation, including research development, testing, and evaluation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. I think another important question to ask is who is a human subject? Um, and I will also turn to the US regulations um, as I answer that question. Obviously, these are the regulations that I am bound by here in the US. Um, other countries have their own regulations, but I think we can kind of work today with a general definition um, based on the US regulations. So a human subject is a living individual about whom an investigator, whether professional or a student, conducting research, one, obtains information or biospecimens through intervention or interaction with the individual and uses, studies, or analyzes the information or biospecimens, or two, obtains, uses, studies, analyzes, or generates identifiable private information or identifiable biospecimens. So why are human subject protections needed? Well, unfortunately, um, history is full of examples of situations where unethical research was done. And while we would like to think of these all in the historical context, there are still, um, there's still unethical research that happens today. And I think it's really important to think about the history and understanding why we have the rules that we have, um, but also to be aware of what has happened in the past as we're thinking about research that is going on today. So I'm going to share a couple pretty major um, examples of uh, egregious research ethics violations. Um, probably some that you are familiar with. And then we'll talk about um, how that led to the regulations and what some of those regulations are. So um, the Nazi medical experiments uh, are my first example. This was research done on humans against their will without their consent during World War II. And there were studies that were looking at things like um, deliberate injury to study wound infection, or um, where the point of death was in high altitude and severe cold conditions, um, seawater drinking experiments, things like that. Um, and eventually, these um, really horrible, uh, horrible examples of research being done on, on people without their consent eventually led to the Nuremberg trials in which 23 Nazi physicians and administrators were accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And 16 of those um, individuals were convicted. And the Nuremberg Code is what came out of this. And the Nuremberg Code is a um, pretty major uh, ethical um, guideline that we still use today. Another example um, here in the United States was the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. 
Um, this was run by the U.S. Public Health Service from 1932 to 1972, a very long study. It was a non-therapeutic study of the effects of untreated syphilis. And um, the participants, and I, I use air quotes there because they were not um, truly consented, uh, were more than 400 black men, only black men, in Alabama who had syphilis. And while there were conversations um, in which they agreed to be part of this research study, they actually weren't told the purpose of the study. Instead, they were told that they were um, being treated for bad blood. And that's probably why many agreed to be a part of the study. Now, in the 1930s and 40s, standard treatments for syphilis became known. The um, United States Public Health Service started sending mobile units out to treat people with syphilis in the community, but they didn't treat the men in this study. Instead, they continued to monitor them and watch what happened with untreated syphilis, even though there was a drug that could, um, could help. So uh, in 1972, a former public health service employee shared this story of what was going on with a journalist. Um, the story became public. There was a massive scandal, a multi-million dollar lawsuit, and eventually in 1997, a presidential apology. But this still, impacts um, how people in the United States view research and um, probably worldwide and is something that we have to earn trust back from. Um, and then finally, a third example that I'll give is much more recent. Um, this is the Havasupai lawsuit against Arizona State University. So in the 1990s, members of the Havasupai tribe in the southwestern U.S. gave biological samples for a diabetes research study based out of Arizona State University. And in 2004, a tribe member learned that those samples had subsequently been used by other researchers for other purposes that were not mentioned in the consent. And there were a lot of objections to this because of what some of that um, subsequent research was about. Um, there were studies, uh, for example, involving schizophrenia that could lead to potential stigmatization of the tribe. It also, some of the research was being done that um, there were evolutionary genetic studies that led to results that actually contradicted the tribe's origin story. And so were, were deeply offensive to the tribe and particularly to those who had participated in the original research thinking that it was just about diabetes. So the Havasupai tribe sued the university and specific researchers and there was a settlement that occurred before the trial that involved the return of the samples and a public apology from Arizona State University but unfortunately, um, damage was done in terms of trust in the institution and, and the research enterprise generally. Similar negative legacy to Tuskegee. And this, this particular example led to other tribes placing a complete moratorium on genetic research in their community. And for many years, um, no genetic research could be done um, in those communities, which impacted both research and the generalizability of research, but also impacted negatively those individuals because they weren't represented in the findings that were coming out during that time. So a, a really big problem that has lasting effects, lasting negative effects. So research, um, research ethics and oversight is often described as having been born in scandal. And having heard the examples that I just shared, maybe this won't come as a surprise. But a lot of the guidelines and regulations that we have today really come out of um, negative, unethical research that happened in the past. They're largely responsive to research ethics scandals or reactionary to fill gaps that other guidelines um, have. So, for example, the Nuremberg Code came from the judicial decision in the Nuremberg trial. It really focused on informed consent and favorable risk-benefit ratio. 
but it didn't really talk about fair subject selection or independent review. Those, those weren't really part of the Nuremberg trials. Really, that was about informed consent and risk benefit ratio. And so then we have the Declaration of Helsinki, which was developed to fill gaps that the Nuremberg Code left. So um, things related to researchers who are also physicians, it's a, there's a focus on favorable risk benefit ratio and independent review. Um, it also distinguishes between therapeutic and non-therapeutic research um, where other guidelines either reject or don't mention the distinction. And then we have the CIOMS guidelines meant to apply the Declaration of Helsinki in developing countries. There's a focus on large scale trials of vaccines and drugs and also um, includes a section on compensation for research injuries that isn't found in other guidelines. And then finally, we have another example. The Belmont Report provides really broad principles that could be used to create rules and regulations. And it was a response to the US research scandals um, such as Tuskegee. So what protections are in place? We've, I've mentioned a few of them. We have the Nuremberg Code dating back to 1947, Declaration of Helsinki, the Belmont Report. In the US, we have the Common Rule, um, which, which started in 1991, but has revisions as recently as 2018. We have international ethical guidelines for biomedical research involving human subjects. We have good clinical practice, um, the Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine. So a lot of different um, guidelines or resources for determining what research is ethical. Um, and then <clears throat> going even um, beyond, most, um, most countries have their own guidelines as well. So we have the general health care law in Nicaragua, for example the National Guidelines for Ethical Conduct of Biomedical Research Involving Human Subjects in Kenya, the National Ethical Guidelines for Health and Health-Related Research in the Philippines, and many, many more, most likely from anywhere you might be from. And then we also have other sources of guidelines and protections. We have laws, we have institutional policies, we have ethics review committees or institutional review boards, and we have research sponsors and funders, and all of these um, can and do provide guidelines and protections for human subjects. But it's not just about regulatory oversight. And so I want to close by sharing a quote from Henry Beecher, who wrote a very famous article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1966, in which he called out examples of unethical research that were happening at that time. And as he said, the ethical approach to experimentation in man has several components. Two are more important than the others. The first being informed consent. Secondly, there is the more reliable safeguard provided by the presence of an intelligent, informed, conscientious, compassionate, responsible investigator. And I love this quote because despite all of the guidance out there, all of the rules, all of the regulations that people have tried to put together to help. Ultimately, if we have responsible, informed, conscientious investigators doing research, we are very likely to avoid the scandals we've seen in the past because the researchers are thinking very critically about their work and making sure that they themselves are protecting their participants um, and so I just want to close with that thought as you um, go off and do your own research. Uh, just remember that this is the type of investigator we all should aspire to be. Um, thank you so much for listening. I will have a second lecture um, that actually focuses on a set of benchmarks that you can use in a more practical way to think through your research and other um, case examples uh, that kind of pulls from all of the guidance that are out there and tries to summarize into eight benchmarks these really critical elements of ethical research. So look forward to seeing you there and um, thank you for joining me today.